There are techniques in history that quietly outperform our modern assumptions. Methods that were not only clever, but so effective they survived centuries of weather, warfare, and the slow grind of time. Among these forgotten feats, medieval carpenters mastered a wood-bonding method that didn't rely on nails, screws, or modern adhesives, yet outlasted almost every tool-based joint produced today. Buildings raised in the late Middle Ages, barns, halls, bridges, even siege engines, still stand with their original joinery, untouched, unmoved, and uncannily tight. This wasn't magic, and it wasn't luck. It was engineering, perfected by generations who lived or died based on whether their structures held. Today you can walk through 600-year-old timber frames in England, Germany, the Baltics, or Scandinavia, and still feel the original tension locked in the wood. For those of us fascinated by military history, frontier survival, or the sheer intelligence of pre-industrial craftsmanship, this technique is more than trivia. It's a reminder that the old ways didn't just work, they excelled. Now let's break down exactly how this bond was made, why it lasted so long, how it resisted every force nature could throw at it, and most importantly, how you can apply the same principles today with nothing more than hand tools and sound understanding. Understanding why medieval joinery became almost immortal. The medieval wood bond that survived for centuries is rooted in the marriage of tight-fitting joinery and controlled wood movement. Carpenters of the 11th to 15th centuries didn't just shape beams to interlock, they shaped them to tighten over time. They relied on the nature of green wood and the inevitable shrinkage that occurred as it dried. When a beam was cut fresh, known as green, it contained high moisture. As it cured, it shrank and compressed inward. Medieval builders used this to their advantage. They fitted mortise and tenon joints so precisely that once the tenon slid into the mortise, the drying wood clamped down like a vice. Add to that the use of dry pegs, usually oak, driven through holes slightly offset, so the peg pulled the joint even tighter, and you get a bond that was literally self-tightening for the first several years of the building's life. No synthetic glue today replicates that natural mechanical lock. The result was a structure that resisted wind shear, vibration, and roof load without developing the play or wobble that weakens modern timber framing. One of the most misunderstood aspects of medieval carpentry is that the builders didn't fear wood movement. They engineered around it. They knew that green timbers twist, shrink, and shift. They anticipated the direction and magnitude of that movement and used it to tighten joints instead of loosening them. For example, they often placed heartwood facing outward on long beams, ensuring that the natural curvature over time pressed the tenons deeper into their housings. They oriented growth rings intentionally to avoid splitting high-stress points, and when they carved joints, they reduced contact where friction should be avoided and increased contact where the force needed to be locked in. This level of nuance means that a 600-year-old joint is usually stronger now than it was the day it was assembled. If you work with timber today, even on a small scale, you can apply the same principle by joining slightly damp lumber with completely dried pegs or wedges. As the damp lumber contracts, the joint becomes almost inseparable. The dry peg technique is one of the most impressive aspects of medieval construction. These pegs, also known as tree nails or trunnels, were shaped with a very slight taper. 
Builders drilled a hole through the mortise and tenon, but they rarely aligned those holes perfectly. Instead, they intentionally misaligned them by a millimetre or two. This practice, known as draw boring, meant that as the peg was driven in, it pulled the tenon tightly into the mortise. The peg's dryness made it hard and rigid, while the surrounding green wood shrank, gripping the peg with enormous pressure. In many surviving medieval structures, archaeologists have found pegs so packed by centuries of compression that they are nearly impossible to drill out without damaging the surrounding timber. If you want to replicate this bond today for a survival cabin, shed frame, or long-lasting workbench, the steps are straightforward. Cut your mortise and tenon cleanly, drill your peg holes slightly offset, Carve a tapered peg from dry hardwood, drive it in firmly, and let the wood do the work. Once the structure stabilises, it will hold even without metal fasteners. One of the uh, more counterintuitive strengths of medieval joinery is just how well it performs outdoors. Moisture doesn't actually loosen these joints because, you see, the peg system doesn't rely on friction alone. It relies on geometry and compression. When humidity rises, wood swells. But since every movement is in a confined space, this swelling actually tightens the joint rather than pushing it apart. Even when the wood dries out, the permanent compression formed early in the building's life, well, it remains locked in place. This is precisely why medieval open-air barns, bell towers and frontier watch structures can stand exposed to centuries of storms. The principle applies equally well in modern off-grid shelters. Build with joinery that tightens under movement rather than loosens, and your structure will survive cycles of rain, cold and sunlight without shifting out of square. So, you see, you can apply these medieval methods in practical modern projects. For survivalist builders or anyone interested in historical craftsmanship, applying this method doesn't require large beams or a team of carpenters. Honestly, you can just start small with a simple timber stool, a bench or a tool rack. Use a fresh-cut limb or small log section for the primary joint, and pair it with dry pegs carved from a different hardwood. Cut a standard mortise and tenon, drill your holes slightly offset, and drive the peg in. Then leave the piece outdoors or in a shed for a season and observe how the bond tightens. From there you can scale upward. A small timber frame shed or smokehouse built with these medieval methods will last decades without relying on nails, screws or modern adhesives. Hunters, homesteaders and reenactors often build packable frames using peg joints that can be assembled and disassembled repeatedly without wearing out. The same self-tightening principle applies to bushcraft tripod structures and long-term shelters where stability matters and materials are limited. Understanding why this technique endures as a historical and practical benchmark. Well, what makes this method worth studying isn't nostalgia, it's efficiency. Medieval societies didn't have the luxury of waste. Every beam took hours to fell, square and season, and every structure had to withstand time and load without maintenance crews or synthetic reinforcement. Their solution was a bond that harnessed the material's natural behaviour, turning wood movement into structural strength. In a world where modern fasteners can fail through corrosion or fatigue, this old method stands out because it improves with age, not despite it. If you're part of this community of history enthusiasts and practical builders, you'll find that every medieval joinery project teaches you more about the material and the people who mastered it centuries ago. 
It's a direct connection to the past and a reminder that some of the most advanced engineering was done long before industrialization. If you enjoyed this deep dive into medieval craftsmanship and want more historically grounded, field-tested knowledge like this, make sure you subscribe to Forgotten Frontlines and share this guide with someone who appreciates real history, real engineering and real skills that still matter today.